everything will be all right. I wonder if you've ever said that to anyone. The world has its own version of that phrase. It kind of blindly hopes that everything will be all right. It'll all work out in the end. In the church, we know it for sure. With God and because of all that Jesus has accomplished, everything really will be okay in the end. This is the end of our series on encouragement, which is very fitting because we will learn today that one day encouragement will end. Our encouragement will no longer be needed because all of our Christian encouragement is focused on Jesus and the end, the last day. We started this series with these words from Hebrews 10. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. When that day comes, we will have reached the goal of all our encouragement. But it will also see the end of our discouragement. The last day will see an end to discouragement, every regret, every disappointment, all of our sadness, and of course, any evil. And that's because God will be our encouragement. He will be our last and best encourager. Our reading from Revelation 21 tells us so. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So there are two things that will encourage us this morning and in this eternity to come. The first, strangely, is judgment. And the second is that the church will last into that eternity. What we do now will have an eternal consequence. But we start with judgment. The day we're encouraging everyone towards is the day of judgment. This is something that's telegraphed in Revelation all the time. In chapter 14, the angel of God preaches the central and eternal gospel. It says there, he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now, the day of judgment is something that scares a lot of people. Judgment is something we would rather avoid. We don't naturally want to find ourselves under any kind of judgment. In fact, there are still lots of folks, even in the church, that are there because they're maybe more frightened of hell than they are delighted about heaven. That might even be you. But here in Revelation, God's judgment, it's combined with worship and being with God. And God takes up that role of chief encourager. He will be the one to wipe every tear from our eyes. No more death or mourning or crying or pain. The old order has passed away. Nothing to fear for those who are God's because they believe in Jesus. And Judgment Day then actually shapes our encouragement. On the last day, we will see God for who he is. Justice will be done. It will be seen to be done. All will be shown the light and all will be vindicated by it. So our encouragement now, our way of life and our way of words will be judged Jesus warns us, I tell you, that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. The empty words are words without the influence of the gospel in them. Go and look at the rest of Matthew 12 where we find that and you'll see 
more of what Jesus says and means. And again, that can be a frightening thought. But there's encouragement in the judgment too. The flip side of that is that our gospel words, the real source of real encouragement, will last forever. They will echo into eternity. One of the great movie lines of the last 20 years is just that. It's from Gladiator. Russell Crowe as Maximus. He rallies his troops. He encourages them into battle and bravery by saying what we do in life echoes in eternity. That's a great line. Very much in line with the fact that our encouragements have lasting significance. It's just like when Jesus says, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. What we do in life will echo in eternity. That will be part of judgment. Do you know what is less quoted from Gladiator is the line that jives a little bit more with these two sides of judgment. Maximus says to the imposter emperor Commodus, he says, the time for honoring yourself will soon be at an end. That is a remembrance and encouragement that we should carry all our days. Will ours be the life that honors God and puts him first and passes his encouragement to faith to others? Or do we honor ourselves, protect ourselves with empty words and a life that maybe doesn't really amount to very much? You see, this is the judgment in mind and the one that we should be encouraged by and not afraid of. You'll know where you land there, but it is meant to be an encouragement to the faithful. And in case you think I've lost it a bit and I'm preaching from the movies, those words we heard from Hebrews 10 say exactly the same thing. What did they say? Let us consider how may we spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day, day of judgment approaching. If we hope for that day, then we are encouraged and we will encourage others. This is what really matters. Everyone else is just paying mortgages, saving for their holidays, buying new cars, drinking wine, enjoying good food and trying to save for their retirement. We all do these things, but the encouragement this morning is that they are not the point. God is. He is the judge we're talking about, and he wants to be our eternal encourager. On the subject of eternity, that's a a word, a notion, a reality that we struggle with. We struggle to get our heads around that, don't we? Just think of the word forever. Can you even imagine such a thing? Maybe the the end of all of this is just as hard to think about. How do we think the world will end? Science fiction and the disaster movie will tell us to imagine meteors colliding with the earth or World War III alien invasions or some other planet-killing disaster. They're usually pictures of shame, of sadness, of loss, of failure. I'm sure many have thought about the COVID epidemic in these sorts of terms. But how will the world end? How do we picture heaven or eternity? Do you know, for our final encouragement this morning, I wonder if we can see if we can become homesick for heaven. The world as we know it will end when Jesus comes back and rebirths the whole universe. That's what our reading tells us. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. 
I think of the disaster movie, the failure, the shame, the sadness of that. There's no tragedy here. Instead, we see newness, a holy city, and a wedding. These are the terms in which we're to picture eternity. And they're really helpful ways of talking about it as well. We're not like the world that sees gloom and disaster as the end. But we're to be the joyful children of God, the honored citizens of heaven itself, and the honored and loved bride of the bridegroom. That newness comes in the lack of a sea in the new heavens and new earth. Now, many will see the lack of a sea as a symbol of no more chaos. The Jews weren't a great seafaring people. The sea held many dangers and unknowns. That's fair enough. But if we were to keep a careful eye on a book like Revelation as a whole, there's another important aspect of this fact of no more sea. It's to do with the absence of evil. Judgment having come, there will only be what is good and right. You see, John has already written to us of seeing uh, the beast rising from the sea to do his work against the nations and the church. But now with no sea, there can be no more Satan, no more beast, and no more evil. There are lots of places we can find that in our Bibles. We can go to Isaiah or Jonah, that's parts of Job or Daniel, etc., etc. But you know what? Jaws was on TV this week. And it reminded me of this fact. Think about the sea, the great deep and dark unknown, the beasts and the monsters of the deep, the threat, the terror. These things can hold much of that for us. They are no more in God's heaven. And then we hear, this strange description, I saw uh, the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Again, cities and, and brides, they're put side by side in a few places in the Old Testament. But what we have here is that reminder that brides look their best on their wedding days. Think of the preparation that goes into the bride on her wedding day. The hair, the nails, the skin regimen, the dress, the shoes, the veil, the rings, the other jewelry. And so she can look her best for her husband. Do you know, when you stand at the front of a church and you watch a bride come down the aisle, it's a special moment. And we see that moment here in Revelation at the end of time on a cosmic scale. Those presented to God on the last day by Jesus will be perfect. They will never have looked better. And all because of him, all because they trusted in Jesus. You see, everything really will be all right. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. What an encouragement. Let's pray about that. Gracious Father, ours is a world that is so touched by sin and guilt and shame, impurity. We feel these things when we watch the news, when we think of ourselves and the sins we've committed. But you are our chief encourager. Yours is an eternity 
It will be new and pure, holy, and full of celebrations of Jesus. We can barely imagine it, but we dare to dream of it. Father, encourage us by these words that we may be those who meet together, who do good all the more as we see heaven approaching. Father, we await your son, Jesus, and we pray in his holy name. Amen.